Tonight, we are starting a new series called Organic Outreach. Organic Outreach. And uh, organic simply means this. It means naturally, right? Uh, how many of y'all know, uh, like, it's real popular now to have organic fruits and vegetables. It means that they're just grown naturally. They don't have pesticides. They don't have all the extra stuff. It's just naturally, right? And then outreach is evangelism. It's, it's sharing the good news, right? Uh, evangelism seems like a scary word. How many of y'all are kind of, you, you kind of hesitant when you hear the word evangelism? Right? Okay. Listen, y'all can be truthful. I'm raising my hand. I'm being for real. All right? Like, somebody says, I'm going to share. Y'all think just because I'm a youth pastor that sharing my faith is easy? Uh, man, it's, it's scary to just walk up to somebody random and start talking about Jesus, right? Like, that's a scary thing. Uh, but here, I'm, gonna, I'm here to tell you something. We are all evangelists for something, right? Uh, listen, I just recently went to Chicken Guy, and uh, listen, I've been evangelist uh, for Zaxby's my whole life. Y'all hear me? I've been an evangelist for Zaxby's Chicken. I've even claimed that it's going to be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's how good Zaxby's is. But I'm telling you, there is a chicken. Oh, yeah. Come on. I need somebody on that. The keys right here. Uh, there is a chicken. Hallelujah. That is far greater than a Zaxby's chicken finger. And it is from Gavier's Chicken Guy Restaurant. Yeah. All right, and so I've become an evangelist now for Guy Fieri's Restaurant Chicken Guy because I'm just going to tell you, it is absolutely incredible. It's the best chicken finger I've ever put in my mouth. They've got 23 different sauces. And I'm just going to say, donkey sauce is the best sauce I've ever tasted. Miss Lindsay will tell you wasabi honey is the best one, but I'm just going to tell you all right now when you go. Donkey sauce is good. Bentley, you mind sitting down for me, bud? Uh, sometimes we're evangelists, and I don't know about y'all, but I have always been an advocate and an evangelist uh, when it came to iPhones. Right? Pastor had an Android phone for the longest time, and I was an advocate. I evangelized to him, tell him how great iPhones were and how much he just needed to make that switch. Pastor, you don't need that old raggedy Android phone. You need the good stuff. You need an iPhone. That's what I told him. And guess what? Eventually, he listened to me. It just took him a little bit of time, but he, he heard me. Brother James and I walks up and says, listen, brother, I got me an iPhone. I said, praise the Lord, you came to the, you, you, you came to the Lord, right? Uh, uh, we, we can evangelize on something we love, right? What's something that you love that you talk about all the time? Jesus. Alex, what's something you love? Xbox, Xbox games. Right, you're an evangelist for Xbox, and you tell all your friends, man, you need to download this new game. You gotta play this with me, right? Sports. Sports? Yeah, right? Uh, you, 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 uh, you love a sport, you're like, man, you gotta support this sport, this sport's awesome. Like, I'm just gonna tell y'all, when it comes to the Winter Olympics, curling is by far the best sport ever known to man. And Miss Lindsay, I turned it off because I love curling. I don't know what it is about curling, it's interesting. It's Exactly, it's incredible. There's so much strategy, right? And, and so, I mean, how? Why wouldn't you want to watch a guy while the skates go with a little stone and, and then they go? Like, why would you not want to watch it? It's incredible. And she's like, "This is the stupidest part I've ever seen in my life." I said, "You're crazy, woman." I'm an advocate. I'm an evangelist for curling. Uh, there's things that we love, and we're just quickly, we're, we want to tell somebody, y'all ever tried a new shampoo? And you're like, girl! God! I got this new shampoo. Hey, bro. I'm not going to any dudes being like, bro, I got this new shampoo to fill my hair. But girls, on the other hand, they're like, girl, let me tell you something. Y'all don't even use shampoo. You don't use shampoo? Y'all school more than one. Oh. I don't. I don't. I got a two in one. Yeah. But uh, girl, I got this new shampoo. Makes my hair feel so soft and beautiful. Feel it. Full of all you. Right? Guys were like, man, bro, listen, I have dandruff, but I tried to sell some blue. Miracle worker. Yeah, what's that called? Sell some blue. Right, give me some. Right? I just became an evangelist for sell some blue. Right? Uh, it's easy. We become evangelists for all kinds of things. Things that we love. Things that we like. 
And it's all the same thing. Listen, I'm telling you, if you love Jesus, if you've been impacted by Jesus, then it should just naturally come out that we want to talk about it. We want to share about him. And I'm just going to tell you, you might tell me, Pastor Thomas, I'm not called to be an evangelist. Guess what? I'm not either. I'm called to be a youth pastor. Uh, but guess what? Just because you don't have the gift of evangelism doesn't mean you weren't called by the Lord to be salt and light. Right? Just because you don't have a certain gift doesn't mean that you still can't operate in a little bit of it. Right? Uh, some people have the gift of giving. They give uh, over in abundance. But that doesn't mean that you don't have the gift of giving. You're still not called to give. Come on, somebody. Or maybe because you don't have the gift of mercy. Well, I don't have the gift of mercy. That, does that mean you're not allowed to show mercy to anybody? No, you still show mercy, right? Just because some people have strong, are strong in one gift does not mean that they're not supposed to operate in a little bit of everything. And so evangelism, you may not be have the evangelism gift, but I'm here to tell you that you are all, we are all called to be some form of an evangelist by being salt and light to this world, right? Yep. So tonight we're starting this new series, Organic Outreach. Here's the book. I'm reading it. It is excellent. It is 100% excellent. Y'all just get the cliff note version. All right? But I'm telling you, y'all, listen, y'all want to know a little secret? Y'all want a secret? Yes. How many of y'all's parents are up, up in the sanctuary right now in the, the class with Pastor and Pastor Chuck? How many of y'all's parents are up there? A couple of them. Let me just tell y'all right now, y'all are ahead of them. They're doing the love chapter today. We're doing love and grace. We're tackling chapter one and chapter two because uh, we're just better than them, okay? That's, that's what I'm telling her. So chapter one is the law of love. And so uh, let me just tell you this. Since we're just going to start right here. It begins with love. Everything, the foundation is love, right? Matthew chapter 22. If you have your Bible, you can write this down, flip there, whatever. Matthew chapter 22 Verse 37 through 40, the, uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees come up to Jesus and they're trying to trick him. And they say, what's the greatest commandment? What's the greatest law? And Jesus thinks for a minute and he says this. Verse 37 of Matthew chapter 22. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And second is equally important. You must love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. And of course, you can't talk about love without quoting John chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. It says this, For this is how God loved the world. He gave His one and only Son so that everyone who believes in Him will not perish, but have eternal life. God sent His Son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. Y'all catch that for just a second, right? We, we're quick to quote John 3.16, but we're, we're quick to forget that there's another verse right after it. It says this, God sent his son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him, right? God sent his son not to be a judge, not to be a critic, not to quickly jump on people, but he sent him in here to save them. And how, did, how does he find them? It's through love, right? Point number one tonight is this. Love demands a search. Love demands a search. There, You must search and seek for somebody who is lost. Romans chapter 5, verse 6 through 8 says this. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time. Hallelujah. And died for us sinners. I added the hallelujah just in case you didn't know that. And that past long that I just said. Okay, verse 7. Now most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still Sinners, why you were at your worst? Why you were while you were in your lowest state? While you were lost in sin, Jesus died for you to save you. 
Luke chapter 19, verse 10, it says this, For the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. Let me just ask you, if Jesus saw it important to come to seek, seek out, search for, find them, and save the ones that are lost, how important do you think it still is if we are going to be his disciples, if we are going to be Christians, which means little Christ, how important do you think that it is if Jesus was that way, that we need to be that way? We are called to find the lost and reach them. But here's, here's the deal. Point number two tonight is this. You have to understand the law of love. There has to be an understanding of the law of love. So let me ask you this. I'm going to start out with some questions here. Who are some people that you know, and you don't have to answer this, and just, just get your brain moving a little bit, get some of that blood flowing. Who are some people you know who don't know Jesus? Y'all know some people? Y'all know people who don't know Jesus? Y'all know people that are lost? Yeah? If you know somebody who doesn't know Jesus, will you raise your hand? We should all raise our hand, probably. Okay? If you didn't raise your hand, you need to make some new friends who don't know Jesus. Because they need, they need the Lord too, okay? So here's the question. If you know somebody who doesn't know Jesus, let me ask you this question. Do you love this person? Do you love that person? They don't know Jesus, but you love them. Or does that person get on your nerves? Come on. Uh, the guy that wrote this book, Kevin Harney, he, he was telling, he said that there was a time where he was at a conference and he was speaking and there was a Q&A session and this guy came up to the podium and said, uh, I've got a question. I've got my neighbor and I'm trying to witness to him and lead him to the Lord. Uh, but I have nothing in common with him and I'm struggling. It's just kind of awkward. What do I do? And Kevin Hardy said he sat there for a minute and he, it came out of his mouth before he could even think and it just he just said, do you love him? And he said he was like trying to take the word back, you know. Uh, but everybody in the conference all of a sudden looks at the guy who grabbed the microphone and was like, you know, it was like this question. The guy was kind of like stumbled by the question. He's like, um, I, I, I don't know. And he says, if you don't love him, stop. You cannot witness to somebody you don't love. Don't, you're, you're going to do more damage than you are good if you're just witnessing without love. See, love is the foundation of evangelism. Love is the foundation of sharing the good news of Jesus. See, we are not called to make the conversion of unbelievers a project to check off of our list of religious duties. Oh, let somebody to the Lord check. No, nope, that's not what we're here to do. But we are here to love people with the love of God, right? That love that I told you I experienced that one day when God met me, that's the love that I'm called to show to everybody that I come in contact with. That's the love that I'm supposed to show somebody who is lost. That's the love that they need, and that's the love that they need to get. So here's the thing. You need to check your heart. Bentley, you mind sitting down for me, bud? Go check your heart. Check it. And ask this. What is your motivation? What is your motivation in trying to lead somebody to Jesus? Is it because you desire to carve another notch in your spiritual belt? Oh, look at me. I've got this spiritual belt because I've led 15 people to the Lord this year. Uh, is that why? Are you leading people to Jesus and sharing the gospel because of a deep sense of guilt or fear like you'll be judged if you don't? Is it because you see a need and you want to fill the empty seats in the church? You want to fill the empty seats in the youth room? Hey, listen, I ain't complaining about filling empty seats. But if that's your motivation, that's the wrong motivation. See, we need to let love show. If you want other people to experience God like you have, that's got to be done through love. Love has to be the foundation of telling somebody about Jesus. Four things to round out the love section is growing a heart of love. Four thoughts right here. Number one, pray that God will give you a heart like Jesus. Pray that God will give you a heart like Jesus. Now, this, this ties into open your heart. You've got to open your heart to the possibility. Now, I'm just going to tell you right now, I'm going to be up front. Y'all want me to be up front with you? This is a dangerous prayer. 
So don't pray it unless you really mean it. Because when you ask God to fill you with a heart like his, for the lost and for the broken and for the undone, he's going to do it. And you can't, you can't go back on and say, wait, hold on, God, I don't, I, don't, I don't want this, I don't want this, I don't want to love them like that. Because when it, when it's in, when it comes in, it's going to flood you, and you're going to all of a sudden care about everybody you come in contact with. You're going to find people and they're going to have disgusted you before and you're going to love them all of a sudden. You're going to say, what is this? But I'm telling you, if we want to do this thing the right way, it all stems from having a heart like Jesus and loving them. Number two is this. Study the life of Jesus. Open your mind. Study the Gospels. Read the Gospels. And every time that Jesus is talking to somebody, notice if he loves them or not. Look at his actions. Look at the way he's what he says. Look at what he does. And you will notice quickly that everything Jesus does, every action, every statement is done in love. Number three is this. Notice and connect with people who are far from God. Notice and connect with people who are far from God. Uh, if you're too busy to hang out with people who don't know Jesus, you're too busy. Time to clear some room in your schedule. That's, that's one of the statements in this book that really got me. Because I'm busy. But I can't be too busy to not try and show people the love of Jesus. And then the last one is, number four, is intimacy with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Listen, you can't have the love of God if you're not staying close to Him. The first part of that whole statement in Matthew was you got to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and, and soul. And if you don't love him, you've got to have that intimacy with him. With him. You've got to build that, that bond with him. And the, the closer you get to him, the easier it is to love people like he, he does. Because you're going to be just in love with him that you're going to want to show that love to somebody else. And so almost that needs to be the first and foremost thing because we have to have that love for God if we want to show others his love. See, if you aren't in love with God, how can you even share about him? Right? I'm in love with Miss Lindsay, and I listen, I ain't scared to tell the world about it. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Only God-empowered love can make us willing to reach out like Jesus did. All right? Chapter 2 goes into this, and it says, Becoming grace bearers. Becoming grace bearers. And I want to try to tackle this really quickly because I'm running out of time. But Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 through 9, very... Uh, great scripture. I just quoted this not too long ago, verse 8 and 9. Uh, but 4 through 9, it says this But God is so rich in mercy, and He loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, He gave us life when He raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For He raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of His grace and kindness towards us, as shown in all He has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. Verse 8, God saved you by His grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this, for it is a gift of God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so no one can boast about it. Listen, your salvation is... It's simply because God granted it to you. God paid the price for it so you didn't have to worry about it. You can't brag about anything you've done. You can't tell people, oh, well, look at me. I've done this, so I'm saved. No, all you did was put your faith in him, and he paid the price. He's the one who set you free. He's the one who changed your life. All you did was nothing. You just took a step. Okay. Let me just tell you this. There are three things. When it comes to this category, it's this, justice, which means getting what we deserve. Mercy, which is not getting the punishment that it that is deserved. And then there's grace, it's giving someone what they don't deserve. Grace doesn't make sense, if, if I'm going to be honest with you. So listen, everybody wants justice, right? We all want justice. When there is something wrong, we stand up. We want justice. We cry for justice, right? Uh, when somebody is killed, a whole family, when, and they're going to court, we demand justice, right? They need the death penalty. We want justice for this family, right? We all want justice for
for something. When, when somebody steals something from you, you want them to pay the penalty. But it's amazing how we cry for justice, but when we are the one who is the perpetrator, we're the one who has done the wrong, we're the one who's not paying attention, and all of a sudden we look in our rearview mirror and there's blue lights. All of a sudden, we don't want justice. We want mercy, right? Uh, we're, not, we're not looking, you know, you're driving along, you, you see blue lights, you're like, oh man, I'm going 15 miles over the speed limit. I had no idea. And you pull over, and the cop comes up. He says, license, registration. You're like, listen, officer, before you even get started, I demand justice. So I know I was speeding, and I want the biggest fine you can give me. I demand justice for my crimes. Nobody does that. And if you do, the cops are going to look at you like you're nuts. Right? You're going, you're just going, okay, oh, was I really going over? I had no idea. Right? Like, you're trying to, like, wave it off like it's not a big deal. Like, show me some mercy, please. But yet, for everybody else, we don't want to give mercy. We want justice. But God is a God of mercy, and we're called to show mercy. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24 through 25. He personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds you are healed. Once you were like sheep who wandered your way, but now you have turned to your shepherd, the guardian of your soul. Today, you know, I'm just, I don't know about y'all, but I've been dealing with a lot of just overwhelm. I've been overwhelmed lately. And so I got in my office this morning and Miss Lindsay texts me and she said, before you do anything, I want to challenge you to turn on some instrumental music, turn everything else off, and read Psalm 23 a couple times. I said, okay, I can do that. So I went and got me a cup of coffee because, you know, that's what every good youth pastor does. Got my coffee, turned my instrumental music, which was already on, opened up my Bible, and I read Psalms 23. And I went like this. The Lord is my shepherd. I haven't needed nothing. He's given me everything. The Lord is my shepherd. And I let that sink in for just a minute. Just began to allow that to speak to me. To the point where I wrote out, and I read the whole chapter multiple times, but the scripture that stuck out to me this morning was this, the Lord is my shepherd. Depending on your translation, it may say, I have no, I have no need for anything. It may say, I have no, no wants. It may say, I have a need of nothing. I, I, but the point is, when the Lord is your shepherd, he's got you taken care of. And that's what Peter's trying to make here. He's trying to say, like sheep, you had no shepherd, but now you have the good shepherd. You've got the guardian of your soul. You've got Jesus Christ as your shepherd. And, and when he's your shepherd, you don't need anything. See, God gave us grace. And grace doesn't make sense. Grace is getting what we don't deserve. And you've been given grace. So here's the question. If you've been given grace, why are you judging the lost? key thing that he said that really stuck out to me is this. We're quick to judge the loss. We're quick to react to the loss. But listen, how can we expect them to act like us if they don't know Jesus like we do? If they're lost, they're lost for a reason. They're not going to act like us. They're not going to be like us. They're not going to speak like us. But yet we just automatically say, well, you need to be like me. Well, they haven't had an encounter with Jesus like you. And so instead of judging them, why don't you love them? Why don't you show them grace and show them mercy and say, listen, you don't deserve this, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. I'm going to love you no matter what. Yeah. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. This is my last scripture for tonight. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sins so that we could be made right with God through Christ. So I want to ask you this question tonight. Are you still amazed by God's grace? Like, are you amazed 
saved by the grace of God? Like, do you sing Amazing Grace and still does it have a meaning to you? Or do you just go through the motions? You're just singing Amazing Grace because, oh, we've always sung Amazing Grace. Like, or do you really understand and comprehend what grace is? My next question is this. How do you show grace? How do you show grace? Grace is not just saying... God's great, God is good, let's thank for food. By says we all pray. Thank you, Lord, for a daily bread. Amen. That's not what grace is. We always say, let's say grace. You know, my response when people says, you want to say grace? I say grace. All right, let's eat. <laughs> but that's not what grace is. Grace ain't about food. Grace is about showing, giving people something that they don't deserve. Four things on how to engage. Engage with a grace starved world. This is my final four points tonight. How to engage in a grace starved world. This world does not know grace. We don't we wouldn't know grace if it we just don't. Number one is this reckless love. You gotta have reckless love. Take chances. Love people who have issues. Give recklessly your love away. The love that Jesus has given you, give it away. Show reckless love. People who it doesn't even make sense to love, you love them. Number two is generous forgiveness. So here's the question you need to ask yourself. Who has wronged me? Who has wronged you? I know, come on, y'all. Y'all know some people that have wronged you. You know some people that you haven't forgiven yet. Let me just tell you this. Why are you refusing to forgive them? What is holding you up from forgiving them? Because here's the question. Uh, I, you can dive in the Bible if you want. If you dive in, you're going to quickly find that the Bible says... Uh, if you don't forgive, God's not going to forgive you. And if you want the forgiveness of your sins, you've got to learn to forgive. That is showing the love and the grace of God to the unbeliever. That is showing the love and grace of God to somebody else. And if you, you need that, and you need to have generous forgiveness, it doesn't matter what they've done to you. You need to forgive them. Amen. What can you do to forgive them? How can you forgive them? You need to really pray about it. You really need to seek this out. Because if you can't forgive somebody, you're, you're in a bad spot. And I'm telling you, if you want to love people, if you want to lead people to Jesus, if you want people to encounter the same Jesus you have, you've got to forgive. You've got to love. You've got to show them grace. Grace doesn't make sense. It may not make sense to forgive them. But I'm here to tell you, you've got to show them grace. And forgive them. All right, I'm done off that hours. Number three, sacrificial giving. Listen, if somebody needs some shoes, hook them up with some shoes. Y'all know what I'm talking about? They need some socks, buy them some socks. They need lunch, buy them lunch. Sacrificial giving. Listen, y'all are sacrificial givers when it comes to speed of light. Let's be sacrificial givers to people who need to know Jesus. You see somebody who needs their, their uh, lawn mowed? Mow their lawn. You need somebody who needs some uh, leaves raked? Rake their leaves. That is showing sacrificial giving. And last one is this, number four. Engage freely. Engage with people. Mm -hmm. Ask this question. Do I avoid certain people? Do you avoid certain people? Are there certain people you walk down the hall, you see them and you're like, ooh, nope. <laughs> we'll walk on this side of the hall. There's certain people at the lunch table, you're like, ooh, nope. I'll sit at this table. Right? There's certain people that you see, like, listen, y'all, this is a real one right here. I'm about to, I'm about to cast cast some condemnation on myself. Uh, you walk in the, in the aisles of Walmart. I almost said the halls of Walmart. The aisles of Walmart. And you peek down the end and you see that person. Oh, I need serious. And you turn around and you try to go the other way. Listen, I've been there. I've done that. There are some people. I'm just telling y'all. Uh, why are you trying to avoid the person? Find out what the reason is because you need to engage with people freely. If you want to show them love, if you want to show them mercy, if you want to show them grace, you've got to engage with them. What can I do to connect with someone who is different than me? 
What can I do that, to connect with somebody who's different than me? Listen, you might not be the loner. You may not be the rocker style. You might not be the, the cool hip-hop person. You might not be the cool jock. You, you might not be the, the, for lack of a better term, the nerdy computer geek. I'm not trying to judge you, I promise. And so you may just write those other people off because they're not like me. But why? What can you do? How can you engage with them? Listen, I was the rocker, loner guy that nobody talked to. I never did drugs. I never drank. I never did everything, anything like that. But I just was standoffish. I didn't want people to talk to me. I didn't want to make a bunch of friends. I didn't care about people. But somebody eventually reached out to me and said, listen, you need Jesus. And they loved me. And eventually I came to know him. And I'm not the same. I'm not the same because somebody loved me. Somebody loved me. This is grace right here. You ready? If I walk out of this room right now and I go to my car and I look and there's a big old scratch along the side of it. And there's a teenager standing there and he's got a key in his hand with the color paint of my car sitting on it and there's paint flaking I have to tell he just keep my car I got a choice I can demand justice you do this to my car you're going to pay for it right uh, or we're going to call the cops I demand justice or he may say listen I know what I did and I'm so sorry I don't know what came over me I just did it and I, I totally regret it and I'm so sorry and I can choose to show him mercy in that moment and I can say you know what it's cool don't worry about it just go home I'll get it fixed not a big deal or I can show him grace and y'all want to know what grace is because this is what God shows us We've wronged God. We're the, we're, the, we're the teenager holding the key going, I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. And God doesn't show us justice. He, he shows us mercy, but he goes beyond mercy and goes into the category of grace. And this is what God does. God says, oh, you keep my car? You know what? It's okay. Here, take my keys. Let me sign the title over to you. Here, take the title. You know what? Go take this to the body shop and send me the bill. I'll pay for the bill to get the, the car fixed for the damage that you did to it. So that way you have a nice car. You know what? Here's, here's a credit card for all your gas. I'll pay for all your gas for a year. That would be crazy. Right? Ain't nobody doing that. Nobody's doing that. But God does that. God shows grace. And that's what we need. We need grace. We need love. If we, if we want to reach people with the love of Jesus, naturally, listen, I'm not talking about the evangelism that scares us. I'm not talking about walking up to somebody random and saying, uh, excuse me, sir, uh, can I tell you about Jesus? That's awkward. Nobody likes that. Listen, if it's awkward for you, it's awkward for it's even more awkward for them. Alright? I'm talking about a kind of love that just comes natural. Hey bro, man, I see your shirt, man. This is that bless that's so cool, man. I like your necklace. Hey man, so you, you, you know Jesus? Oh, yeah, man. Like it just comes natural, it just flows out of you. You just build a bond with somebody, it just comes. Right? That's what we need. So let's pray before we dive into these altars to 